Good morning. Let's open in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you've stirred this morning in this body, Lord. We thank you for the words that have been spoken forth. I pray that everyone that heard those words, Lord, would take heed and apply them to their lives, Lord, and allow you to help them apply it to their lives, Lord. Thank you for the testimonies this morning, Lord, and thank you, thankful that those were shared. May those be an encouragement to others who heard. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to pray over BIAC, Lord, and we just continue to stand in faith, stand in confidence, Lord, that you will heal. And we look forward to that so that we can celebrate it, Lord, and so that it can give BIAC more things to share with those people she's already been speaking to, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that everyone today and every day, Lord, whenever you speak, through whomever you speak, would have ears to hear, hearts to receive, Lord. And that these words would make their way into our soul and remain there, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Psalm 34, we're going to do part three. Um, we'll do, I'm going to read Psalm 34 again this morning. We'll do a brief review of part one and part two, and then we'll jump into part three. <clears throat> so Psalm 34, starting in verse one, this is the ESV version. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory, from, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Amen. The review of part one, that title was Praise Amidst Trials, and we just talked about David showing us the best way to exalt the Lord to his rightful place in our lives, even amidst the trials, right? It's very easy for us to get distracted or refocused onto the problem rather than God as the solution, and praising the Lord brings our attention back to him. You can't praise the Lord half-heartedly. You praise him wholeheartedly, and when you do that, he's back in focus, and that's what we aim for. He shows us how to respond in trials and tribulations with praise of the God, the one and only God of all the heavens and the earth. We must not allow the trials in our lives to grow greater focus in our minds or hearts than the power of the living God, or we will falter. Praise the Lord for what he has done and what he will do through the trial. That's where faith is. Faith is not relying just upon what he's done in the past. Faith is knowing that if he did it before, he'll do it again. Praise him continually. Praise Him openly, praise Him fervently, praise Him together, one with another. Part two, earnestly seeking the Lord is rewarded. David's very clear in verses four through eight on the process of seeking. In verse four, he says, I sought the Lord. This is an active process filled with desire to encounter the Lord, to see the Lord, to experience the Lord, to understand His direction on your life. Verse 5 says, those who look to him, we ask the question, when you look to the Lord, is it a glance or is it a consistent focus upon him? Which one is it? One of those will get you through, one of those will not. 
Verse 6 says, The poor man cried, Make your request known to the Lord audibly, because he cares. Verse 7, The Lord encamps around those who fear him. Think about that. Think about the Old Testament when they couldn't see all of the armies and the angels of the Lord gathered around until their eyes were opened and the Lord was surrounded around them and brought them to victory. He does the same thing for us when we enter these situations, regardless of what kind of situation it might be. Blessed is the Lord, or excuse me, blessed is he that takes refuge in him. Y'all remember the example we used there? If I want to be under the shade tree that's here in the back part of the property, I can't stand in the front road and expect to find the shade. To draw refuge, to take refuge in something means drawing close to it. It's an intentional drawing close, going toward. Otherwise, you can't take refuge. The other example was the bridge. People see people park under the bridge during the storms. Well, if you see the bridge, but you don't actually get under it, you're not protected from the storm. We have to take refuge by physically and spiritually, mentally, everything moving toward the Lord. Otherwise, we're not close enough to have refuge in Him. Each verse is an actionable call to us a map of how we respond in trials, seeking the Lord fervently, expectantly, and fearfully. We expect to reap the rewards of earnestly seeking. David spells this out in the verses. He says in verse 4, he answered and delivered, meaning the Lord answered and delivered. It is cries, David's cries, none of our cries fall on deaf ears. Verse 5, those who look to him are radiant and they shall never be ashamed. You think about Moses when he would come away from Mount Sinai and the glory would fade from his, mouth, uh, from his face and he would wear the veil. He wasn't wearing the veil because he was embarrassed about the glow from him. He was wearing the veil because he didn't want them to see that it was fading. And much the same with us. When we approach the Lord, we seek him. He will deliver us. And one of the ways that he delivers us is, is not allowing the burden to be so heavy that we just look distraught and beat down and defeated all the time. We will be radiant when we look to him. The Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. Every single one. It says all. It doesn't say some. It doesn't say this one, but not that one. It doesn't say Tuesday, but not Thursday. Verse 8, blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. In verse 9, if we take refuge, if we seek the Lord, it says clearly we will have no lack. The Lord is the provider, and he desires to provide. Psalm 34 this morning, part 3, we'll be looking at keeping your tongue. That's the title of the message this morning, Psalm 34, part 3, Keeping Your Tongue. <clears throat> and I want to start with a, an example. Have any, has anybody ever heard the phrase, loose lips sink ships? Does anybody know where it originated? I didn't until I looked it up. So it's interesting. I'm going to read this. This, this idiom, this phrase, began during World War II as a slogan used by the United States Office of War Information. It was part of a propaganda campaign, so the slogan, Loose Lips Sink Ships, was printed on posters and hung in many public places, such as schools and churches. This wartime expression warned people in the military, as well as ordinary citizens, to watch what they say. Unguarded talk may give useful information to the enemy. Part of the propaganda campaign warned that simply revealing the location of a loved one on a ship could be dangerous. That information could be passed on to the enemy or to a spy. The posters show in detail a ship being attacked and soldiers being killed. This idiom may not make sense to you, so let's break it down. Something loose means to move easily. So, loose lips move freely and release a lot of words, most likely in a careless way. If you speak carelessly, that's the loose lips part, about private or sensitive information, someone could hear and use it to damage or ruin something important. The moral, be careful what you speak. Watch what you say. And that's going to be the crux of what we talk about this morning. As we look at Psalm 34, we get to a verse 11, and David shifts from praise and worship and guiding us on how to seek the Lord. He shifts us a bit. And he says, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. He wants to teach what he has learned, what he has gained through his experiences in life. He wants to pass those along. He asks a rhetorical question, really two rhetorical questions in verse 12. He says, what man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Who doesn't desire life, wants to see good? 
Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Obviously, these are questions that we all know the answer to. Yes, I want those things. There's not anybody reading this present day or in David's time when they were hearing it that wouldn't say, pick me, pick me, I want a long life. Nobody's going to say, no, 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 I'm good, just go ahead and take me now. When, what David says next is a theme that is repeated throughout Scripture over and over and over again. There are over 120 passages dealing with words and usage of our mouths. Verse 13, keep your tongue from evil. And your lips from speaking deceit. <clears throat> Look at a couple of definitions on these words. That word keep, it's an action word. It requires doing, it requires effort and consistency on our part. That word most often is used to watch, to guard, to preserve. Man, give me a minute. It's also used the principle of a watchman. Y'all remember the watchman from the Old Testament? Ezekiel stands out to me. <clears throat> when the Lord says, I will make you a watchman over the nation of Israel. But he had certain duties, didn't he? He had a duty to watch and to speak forth the warning. And if they ignored him, well, that's their fault. But if he spoke it forth, or excuse me, if he neglected speaking it forth, then it was his fault. We must be measured and unthoughtful in our words, no matter when or where or with whom, but even more within the body to prevent division or damage to Christ's bride. The word evil, most often used as misery, injury, calamity, distress, wrong, or adversity. Words are things. They have a life of their own. Anybody who said or has heard, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt, that is a lie. Words have the power to lift up or the power to destroy. The effect of words can last a lifetime, can't they? Everybody here can remember a time when something positive was spoken over them. You can remember who said it. You can remember when they said it. You can remember how they said it. You can probably even remember what they were wearing when they said it. Why? Because it's that powerful. Unfortunately, we can also remember something negatively spoken over us, can't we? And the same things come to mind. The tone of voice, the volume of voice, the expression on the face, these things last. Words have power. The last word we'll look at this morning is the word deceit. The King James Version uses the word guile. Most often translated or used as deceit or treachery. It's not only deceit coming out of the mouth, but I think we deceive ourselves and others with our words. Let me try to make sense with that. If we profess our faith, and everyone openly knows that we are Christians, knows that we attend church, that we profess these things, where we are loose with our words, we are deceiving ourselves and thinking that we're living the way that we're meant to live. We're deceiving the body that we're a part of and possibly damaging the reputation of the body because we have loose lips. And we're damaging God. Why? Because we say we believe all these things, yet we don't wrap up, we don't control, we don't keep those words under wraps the way that we should. Loose lips sink ships. James 3, 9 through 10 says, With it, meaning the mouth, <clears throat> with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Y'all, this is a struggle for every single person in here. We have to confront it. We can't let it beat us. Matthew 15, 18 says, But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. The main topic we're going to talk about this morning is slander or gossip. 
And there's going to be three ways we're going to look at it. But before we get there, I kind of want to talk a little bit about slander and gossip from a biblical perspective and build that up, okay? When you look at 1 Timothy 3.11, it says their wives, meaning the, this is the qualifications of elders and deacons, it says their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. 2 Timothy 3.3 says, talking about the end times, they'll become heartless, unappeasable, slanderous. Some scriptures use the phrase false accusers, without self-control, brutal, not loving good. The word slanderers and the word false accusers comes from the Greek diabolos, which is translated 35 other times. You know what it's translated as? Devil. Did y'all get that? The devil. Devil is slander. Devil is the slanderer. And when we're not careful with our words, we're actually carrying out the things he wants. Strong's Concordance defines its biblical usage as prone to slander, slanderous, and accusing falsely. The etymology, <clears throat> excuse me, the etymology of diabolos comes from uh, Strong's G 1225 Diablo. It is used one time in the King's James and translated accuse, signifying to hurl across, to throw, and suggest a verbal assault. What is a slandering person? When you look at the legal definitions of slander, uh, it's the action or crime of making false spoken statements during, or excuse me, damaging to a person's reputation. You hear it, they're suing someone for slander, and then they have their reasons for it. Defamation of character is a catch-all term for any statement that hurts someone's reputation. Written defamation, written defamation is called libel, while spoken defamation, def, uh, Spoken defamation is called slander. I'm glad I'm done with those words. <laughs> it can not only entail someone who brings a false charge against someone. Y'all hear this. It's very easy for us to say, but I don't slander everybody. I don't sled, spread lies. It's not only can not only entail one who brings a false charge against one, but also those who disseminate the truth regarding a man, but does so maliciously or with hostility. So you can slander by not telling lies. You can slander by being truthful to people who don't need to know about it. If we, it can be speaking of things we think we know or perceive. How many people operate off what you think you see? You think you understand. You think you know what's happening there. But if you're not directly involved, you don't know what's happening there. And therefore, your mouth should stay closed. It can be speaking of things we think we know or perceive, but spoken without confirmation or without purpose. What's the point of speaking? Is it to lift up? Is it to exalt? Is it to make yourself feel better because they're struggling with something that you're not struggling with, so now you've got that pride inside? I don't know. Those are questions that you guys have to answer for yourselves. You think about this, Slate, Slayton. Satan slandered Job, didn't he? He didn't spread lies about Job. What did he do? He came to God. Yeah, but is he going to be faithful if you take all the stuff away? You stop providing for him? You stop blessing him? You take away the protection? Is he still going to be faithful to you? Those weren't lies. But he slandered Job. Job 1.6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. This whole chapter blows my mind, but... And he says, doth Job fear God for naught? Is he really faithful? Satan didn't tell lies about Job. He presented things that would make others question Job. And we saw that happen with his three friends that came along. Can't our words do the same? Can't our speech do the very, very same? Let's talk about intent for a moment. Intent is a very important topic when you think about this. My kids, just like most of your kids, when someone injures someone accidentally, 
They'll come in and say, oh, so-and-so hit me, or whatever happened, right? They tell you the story. And then you go to the person who is the perpetrator in that moment. Well, I didn't mean to. Well, I know you didn't mean to push him off the trampoline, but you did push him off the trampoline. Your actions are much greater than that of your intent. Think about, in the legal world, you think about manslaughter versus murder. They're different, right? They're different in the aspect that it goes to a discernible intent. Typically, manslaughter is lack of a discernible intent. Manslaughter involves someone losing their life at the hand of another, but due to some bad choice, inattention, or uh, not because there was an intent to kill that person. You think of someone with DUI or DWI or street racing, their point is to have fun, to do their own thing, to be in their own world. They have no intent to kill someone. Murder, on the other hand, there's varying degrees of murder, but there is a discernible intent to kill another, to take the life of another. Think murdering for insurance proceeds or pure hatred, just a general disregard for life, or you think about the gang warfare. Here's the point. Even though there's a difference in intent between manslaughter and murder, someone's still dead. The end result is the same. Someone's life has ended at the hands of someone else. Slander is much the same, isn't it? Whether you intended to slander or not, your actions will dictate if you did. And the outcome is the same. Slanderous words spoken are still hurtful and sinful. So I was preparing for this. I came across this quote, and this is really what helped me with the, the crux of this message. It says, The evil tongue slay three, the slanderer, the slandered, and the listener. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at each one of these three roles because in any conversation, situation about someone else, there's always those three parties, right? You have someone speaking something, potentially slander if it's spoken wrongly. You have the person or the topic of that conversation, which is the slandered person. And you also have the listener. We may talk to ourselves in our head, but I don't think many of us talk to ourselves out loud. So there's always somebody on the other end of that conversation. So we're going to look at the slanderer first, the speaker of those words. <clears throat> Typically happens because the heart's in the wrong place when speaking things we shouldn't to people that shouldn't hear. It can be caused by a lot of different things. Matthew 18, again, Matthew 15, 18 says, but what comes from the mouth proceeds from the heart, and that defiles a person. What's in your heart when you're speaking? Are we looking to deal with somebody else's issues so that we don't have to look at our own? Are we just unloving? When we speak to others, we must ask, ask ourselves, is this right and worthy to share? How did I know this information? If there's an issue where there is a quarrel or a disagreement or an offense, have I heard both sides? Was the information shared in confidence? So if somebody shares something with you in confidence and then you go speak to somebody else, it's no longer in confidence. Is there any benefit to anyone for sharing this, whether it be the person listening or the topic of the conversation? Does it benefit them in any way? This is a big one here. How would I feel if the roles were reversed, I was the topic of conversation and someone was speaking about me? Would I approve of that conversation? Would I feel loved in that conversation? Would I feel supported in that conversation? Or would I feel like I'm pushed to the side and whatever issue it is, whatever is being talked about, is being, there's a spotlight being thrust upon me in a negative way? You have to ask yourself, am I being led of the spirit or of the flesh? There's a difference. The spirit would lead in a way toward encouragement edification, potentially admonishment, correction, or rebuke. But it would be for their sake, for their improvement, for their benefit, for their blessing. If that's missing, and we're talking just to talk, then we're giving into the flesh, 
The flesh would lead in a way where we just want to chat about things going on under the guise of caring. We just want to know. Hey, did you hear about? No, I didn't tell him. Even though we wouldn't say it directly to the topic of conversation. Again, if that person walked into the room, would that conversation stop or would it continue? If it would stop suddenly, you have a problem. If you wouldn't say it directly to whom you're speaking. So if this is something that you're speaking with someone else about, and they say, have you talked to so-and-so about it? No, I'd never do that. Then what are we talking about? Make no mistake, there will be times when we are to speak one another about things we see or hear that are incorrect or improper or maybe just a slightly amiss. But we do it directly to that person from a place of love and concern for them. It is our expenditure into them. It has nothing to do with us other than our participation. In an effort to encourage and exhort and care for, or even to correct a situation where a wrong may have happened between two people. But even then, Scripture gives us an outline on how to happen, how that should happen. If you're in that situation where there is an offense that has been taken by one and somebody wants to share it, we have to understand who's, what, what the purpose is of sharing. And I think we'll get into this in a moment on one of the other parts of the conversation. But Matthew 18, 15 through 17 says this when you're talking about an offense. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. Why? Just because? No. That every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. There is a process when we think we've observed something improper. And if we subvert that process then the process doesn't have any effect to help those situations. Words are powerful and meant to be used with holy, righteous purposes. We must constantly measure our words to make sure we don't end up in the seat of the slanderer. Measuring your words means you think before you speak. I think everybody's heard the analogy of having a filter in place. We have to filter what we say before we speak it. So that we can understand, is this the right thing to say? Is it the right time? The right place? Is it even, should it even be spoken? James 1.26 says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Proverbs 18.21. Listen to this one. Death and life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. What fruit do we eat when we speak? Are we eating life? Or are we eating destruction? Proverbs twelve eighteen. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Think about that. Are your words a salve that can soothe, that can medicate, that can help, that can encourage, that can exhort? Are they words that are sharp, that are pointed with no purpose other than to hurt? What fruit does your mouth yield? Measure your words to keep from being in the seat of the slanderer. Amen? Amen. Second party to these conversations, well, sort of the party of the conversation, it's the slander, the one being spoken of. When things are spoken of that shouldn't be spoken of, three principles of covenant are broken. That should mean something. As important as covenants are in Scripture, taking part in something that puts you in a place where you're breaking covenant should, should scare you. And when these principles of covenant are broken, it can put the covenant relationship in jeopardy. 
Covenant relationships are meant to be preserved and protected at all cost. So covenant number, uh, excuse me, covenant principle number four says, I will defend you against any, any who speak or, ah, uh, uh, start over. I will defend you against any who speak or act against you unfairly and will refuse to speak negatively of you myself. To unfairly speak ill or listen to slander, participate in any way, shape, or form is divisive and unloving. Proverbs 16, 28 says, a, disma- a, ugh, my goodness, y'all. a dishonest man, my mouth is going, I don't know, which way does that work? Does your brain go faster than your mouth? I don't know. I think that's what's happening. A dishonest man spreads strife. And a whisperer spread, separates close friends. Why are you whispering? Proverbs 17, 9 says, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. We cannot be in covenant and exercise our words in a way that is divisive or separating. Principle number five says, I will honor you and obey those over me in the Lord. To honor is to esteem highly. Slander is not esteeming highly. Honoring would be putting our brothers and sisters first. Slander puts the flesh first. Honoring is seeking to support and encourage one another. Slander does just the opposite. Proverbs 11.13, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps the thing covered. If we're not careful with our words, we dishonor those that we speak of. Principle number six says, I will be faithful to you and will not treat my covenant responsibilities lightly. God is faithful in covenant and requires us to be faithful as well. Being faithful to one another is not speaking out of turn about someone or something. It is sharing, not sharing what was meant to be in confidence. The person being slandered is always hurt emotionally and spiritually. Left unchecked, slander or gossip will bring a church down from the inside out. Because there is no trust, because there is no safe space, there is no true love and care for one another when we are more concerned about what we know and how we know it rather than should we know it or should we say it. Before we speak slander or gossip, we must consider the cost by asking ourselves, what would I want for myself in this situation? The last party to these conversations is the listener. You might think that the listener doesn't have any accountability, but we'll show you in a minute how you do. The listener of gossip and slander can be injured in two ways. They have now heard something they weren't meant to hear. Being told something that changes your view or opinion on someone. You didn't know that this was happening, and now you know it, and maybe you weren't ready for it, and maybe you already had trouble with someone over the years, and now... You've got this weird thing inside of you bringing back things that shouldn't be brought back. Something private and confidential now being more in the open. Possibly furthering an issue that the speaker knew nothing about. Proverbs 18.8 says, The words of a whisper are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. The other way that they injure themselves as a listener is they've allowed themselves to participate in hearing what they weren't meant to hear and to no gain for anyone involved. They're now a party to the slander. If you do not stop the slander, you are now a party to it. As listeners, we can break the same covenants that the speaker of slander and gossip does. We break number four. If we allow wrong conversation, y'all hear that? If we allow the wrong conversation, if we don't stop it, if we have some discernment that it shouldn't be happening and we let it go, if we allow wrong conversation, we are not defending our brother and sister. Principle number four. 
If we allow wrong conversation, we are not honoring the speaker or our brother and sister, principle number five. If we allow wrong conversation, we are not faithful to the speaker or our brother or sister, principle number six. As listeners, we must be bold to ask questions to identify if something is worthy of being spoken about. It's okay to ask questions. We cannot just sit and listen without determining if what we are hearing should be heard by us. We have just as much responsibility in that conversation as listeners to start listening and really pay attention and discern, I don't know if you're supposed to be telling me this, Steve. Why are you telling me this? Are you asking for help? If, you're being, if an offense is being shared with you, are you asking me to help you in the offense? Like, Do you want me to go with you, be one of the ones that scripturally says to go with you and talk to the other person involved? No. What are we talking about? The listener is really the last line of defense in slander and gossip, if you think about it. Someone's ready and willing to speak. It's the listener that can say, whoa, I think we're on the wrong track here. A good listener will be able to hear and discern if a conversation should be stopped or redirected. And it doesn't have to be rude or condescending. You don't have to cover your ears and run away screaming. Now, if they don't listen to you, you might have to do that. Explain that you want to protect the speaker and whoever's being spoken of from harm. You want to honor both parties. It's not just about keeping this person safe. It's about keeping the entire covenantal relationship, fellowship, relationship safe. Explain that you want to protect them. As listeners, there is accountability. Again, I can't say this enough. Failing to halt wrong conversations makes the listener just as sinful as the speaker. The moment you begin to participate in it, you are now guilty of it. Everybody with me? Everybody okay? <clears throat> Getting close to the end here. Our words matter. Every single one of them. God spoke the world into existence. He spoke to Adam and Eve. He spoke to Moses and many others. There is power in words. There is importance in words as we are meant to communicate with one another. Words are used in confession when we repent and when we preach the gospel. Words are meant to be measured and applied righteously. If we fail to measure our words, we fail God and our brethren and our sisters. This is a quote from a book that I've read before, War of Words by Paul David Tripp. It says, words are powerful, important, significant. It was meant to be that way. When we speak, it must be with the realization that God has given our words significance. He has ordained them for, excuse me, he has ordained for them to be important. Words were significant at creation and at the fall. They are significant to redemption. God has given words value. He has a design for our communication, a specific plan and purpose for the talk of the body of Christ. He has a way that he wants us to be responsible for our words and communicate with one another. We have to submit to that just like we submit to anything else in life. I'll say this again, I said earlier, Scripture has a lot to say about our mouths, our words, and our speech. There are over 120 passages, many with a heavy warning. Let this message serve as a reminder, an encouragement, and an admonition. As I was writing this, I was reminded a few weeks ago of Biak's dream that she had where she talked about the attacks coming hotter and heavier as we continue to move forward in faith for the things that God wants us to do as this body and then obviously the global church. You don't think this is one of the primary ways he seeks to tear this thing down? You don't think that getting us to use our words wrongly that his design is to rip us apart from the inside? If we can't fellowship together and use our words properly, how in the world can we work for the Lord? 
We can't. We're dysfunctional. We're disjointed. We're not unified. He's always lurking, man. Like, be careful with your words. Be careful. It starts in the mind. Like these thoughts that shouldn't be there, if we allow them to stay there, they come out of our mouth. That's why it's so, inter- so important that we start by taking the thoughts captive so that we can keep the words and we can measure the words more accurately. If you're successfully taking thoughts captive, it means you're measuring what's in your head, and it's a little bit easier for you to measure what comes out of your mouth. Carefully weigh your words, for from them spring death or life, righteousness or sin. There's no in-between. Are your words a fountain of life or a stabbing sword? Do your words lift up or put down? Are your words based on truth or rooted in deceit? I pray for myself every day. I pray for everyone hearing this and everyone in this body and anyone who's listening online. We have to pray for the Lord to create in us a clean heart and a right spirit. And allow those to lead us in everything, especially our words. This is hard. That's why James talks about the tongue being untamable. You think about the, the example he uses, the ship's rudder and the bit in the horse's mouth. If you have a horse that's uncontrollable, you don't just put him in the barn. You learn how to control it for him to be useful. If you can't steer a ship because the rudder's broken, you don't just scrap the ship and leave it in the shipyard. You replace the rudder. If you want our words to be righteous and holy and not full of sin and deceit, we have to allow those to be submitted to the Lord as well. We allow the Lord to fix our heart because from that becomes our words. Last thing as we close, Ephesians 4.29 tells us what we should seek and how we should seek it. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. How much? None. 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 Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. But only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may be that it may give grace to those who hear. Does slander or gossip give grace to anyone? Our words are real. Our words are powerful. We were created in the image of God, and he spoke, and now we also speak. We have to be careful. Can I ask a few questions again, and then we'll close in prayer? Are your words a fountain of life or a stabbing sword? Do your your words lift up or put down? Are your words based on truth or rooted in deceit? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you spoke to us all the way back in Genesis, Lord. I pray that you continue speaking to us, Lord. I pray that you are a perfect example of the proper use of words, Lord. Lord, I pray for this body. I pray for the universal body, Lord, that we would allow our hearts to be renewed, our spirits to be refreshed by your spirit, your truth, your will, your ways, Lord. Help us to guard our mouths, Lord. Help us to guard our thoughts, Lord. Not only for the sake of ourselves, not only for the sake of the listener, Lord, but for for the sake of the body as a whole, Lord. We cannot be one that speaks anything but truth in the right way. Lord, I pray against disunity here and in your universal body, Lord. I pray that words would be used responsibly here, everywhere. I pray that we would mind our thoughts, Lord. I pray that we would mind our words, Lord. I pray, Lord. I repent, Lord, for the moments that I've... for the moments that I've faltered, overshared, shared out of the wrong reasons, or just spoken words that were sharper than what they needed to be, Lord. I repent, Lord. I ask your forgiveness, Lord, but not only your forgiveness, Lord. I ask for your guidance and your ability to be better. 
Lord, I pray that every single person here, Lord, if this message has brought any sort of conviction upon them, Lord, I pray that they would act on that this morning. Do not leave this room. Do not turn off this message if you're listening at home until you have repented and asked for forgiveness and asked for help to move forward. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you're such a loving God, such a gracious God, such a patient God, Lord, that even when we falter, Lord, sometimes in the same way over and over, that you're still there, ready to forgive and ready to enrich and to help us to grow, Lord. I pray that we would submit to that, Lord. I pray that we would constantly allow you to search us and lead us and guide us and do all things holy, Lord. Let there be nothing that's untouchable, nothing that's off limits, Lord. Whatever you want to show us, Lord, I pray that you show this body, individually and collectively, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.